Okay, good evening everyone. Um, so I'm Ann Chick and I work for the International Joint Commission and the International Joint Commission is a binational treaty organization. And this is the short course to explain what that is. Um, oh, I have to move my own. Aha, got it. Okay, so um, the Boundary Waters Treaty was negotiated in 1909. Um, first of all, I have to say I have the unique uh, presentation for these two days. I have no pictures of Lake Champlain flooded um, or of any stream or river in uh, New England. Um, so anyway, so in 1909 there was a Boundary Waters Treaty was negotiated and primarily it was a time of industrialization of the Great Lakes and other boundary waters. And the U.S.-Canada Boundary Waters Treaty established the International Joint Commission. We were created by the treaty. So it's, um, the purpose of the treaty was to prevent and resolve d disputes over the use of waters shared by Canada and the United States and to settle transboundary issues. It's primarily a dispute settlement mechanism. At the time, in 1909, disputes were over water that was already, there was tension on the border. Settlers in Montana and Alberta each had competing canals taking water out of the St. Mary and Milk River and the settlement for those two rivers is actually within the treaty. And then on the Niagara River, it was clear that there was a conflict between the folks who wanted uh, transportation up and down the river and those who wanted to build hydroelectric power dams. And so the treaty was created as a framework to deal with those disputes. Okay, this is our favorite map. Um, the boundary waters are defined within the treaty and basically as the fresh waters that form the border between US and Canada. 40% of our border is water. Um, let's see, and we heard a lot today about sort of communities, communities have to work together, we have to worry about what happens downstream. The Boundary Waters Treaty exists because people realize that what happens downstream goes into Canada or into the United States depending upon which way the water is flowing. So in our case, as far as we're concerned, the community of the basin consists of both Americans, US and Canadians, on both sides of the border. And that's something that um, the International Joint Commission can address. So the treaty basic purpose, as I said, is to avoid or resolve disputes between the two countries. It provides the framework and it establishes a way to share the benefits um, from all the boundary waters. And its scope is more than just the boundary waters, but it does have a mandate to deal with the entire transboundary environment. And the, within the treaty, it establishes certain principles and mechanisms um, to resolve the disputes. And we like to say that the Boundary Waters Treaty was ahead of its time. Many of us think the environmental movement began in the 1970s. However, the Boundary Waters Treaty does have a pollution mandate. And I'm going to read this just for the translators. So the waters heron defined as boundary waters and waters flowing across the boundary shall not be polluted on either side to the injury of health or property on the other. So that's within the treaty and it's the essential mandate for the water quality um, agreements that go across the border. And back then the issue was typhoid, fevers, epidemic, and contaminated drinking water was the main basis for that. Okay, this is the basic organization chart um, for the IJC. Uh, at the head of it, the decision makers are six commissioners, three US, three Canadian, uh, appointed by the president on the US side and by the governor general's office on the Canadian side. Um, Danielle, correct me if there's another word for that. <laughs> And um, then there's two, three different offices. There's a US section in uh, Washington, which is where I work, a Canadian section in Ottawa, and then there is a joint section in Windsor, which is primarily responsible for the Great Lakes Treaty implementation. Underneath that, we have boards or task forces across the border. So any of the boundary basins on the other map, most of them have a board to go with them. One of the major exceptions is Lake Champlain which does not have an IJC board. Okay, so how does the IJC get its work? We have two main ways. Um, the first is that we respond to a reference. A reference is a formal request from the two national governments, US and Canada, 
to look at a specific matter or problem and to make a report setting out findings and recommendations. The reference by custom has always come from both governments and word for word, it's the same. So they spend a year negotiating the letter that comes to us. We get a matching one from both governments. And in the uh, case of Lake Champlain, our new one, it did take about a year to get that letter. Um, the I, these IJC reports, based on the references, are advisory. They are not binding. So when we give the recommendations back to the government, they are just that, recommendations. The percentage of the recommendations acted upon by the two governments is generally quite high. But again, it is not mandatory, it's not a law. The other way we get work is by an application. Um, the application, the commissioners, the commission, makes a decision acting in a quasi-judicial manner on applications for structures received by or presented to it by the two governments. So if a private company wishes to build a dam, they uh, submit an application to the governments and the governments submit it to the IJC. The IJC can make a decision on whether or not to allow the building of a structure. Oh, did I change that? Okay. whether or not to uh, build a structure on, over, or under a boundary waters, and the issue is whether it will affect the natural level or flow in the other country. Okay. If the application is approved and a structure is built, then there is an order on that structure. And with the order, the IJC almost always would set up a permanent control body, which would be one of the boards that was mentioned earlier. Okay, so for Lake Champlain, in March, the IJC received a request from the U.S. and Canada governments asking the IJC to make a recommendation regarding a comprehensive study of measures to mitigate flooding and the impact of flooding in the Richelieu River and the Lake Champlain Basin. I want to make clear that this was a request to do a plan of study. This is not a full reference. It's a preliminary request to think about doing a reference, basically. Um, and that makes a legal difference in terms of a continuing mandate for the organization. As a result of that letter, the IJC formed a work group of technical experts in the region with members from both federal governments, Quebec, Vermont, New York, and the Lake Champlain Basin Program. And the purpose of the work group is that they will develop a plan of study that will establish specifically or make recommendations specifically about what studies are necessary to have an evaluation of the causes and impacts of the flooding that occurred during the spring and summer of 2011, what studies are necessary to develop appropriate mitigation solutions and recommendations. And I want to make clear that this study is primarily focused on the spring flooding of Lake Champlain and the Richelieu River. It is not focused so much on the Irene flooding that happened afterwards. So this work group was just recently formed. Many, almost all of the members were here today. I'm not sure how many are here tonight. Um, its website is up on the IJC website. So if you go to the IJC.org and look on boards and work groups, there is now a new title there that says Lake Champlain Richelieu River Work Group. And if you go there, you will see their mandate, their letters, the directive, and a list of the members. Um, and later on when there's publications or public meetings or whatever, they will all be on that IJC board's website. So, that's it for me. Thank you.